Hi everyone, I'm Stephen and welcome to Watch Out. This is a watch. Yes, believe it or not, this essentially is what a watch is. I've always found watches to be fascinating mechanical instruments, which is what they are. So I thought I'd just explain in this video the essentials as to what is needed to make a watch movement run. And in pretty much most movements, that's what you're looking at right now. All the other bits are ancillary. So I just thought I'd show you what these parts are, explain each one to you, and then what we'll do is we'll assemble them into the movement just so that we have the minimum that's required to actually make a watch run. So this will hopefully help a lot in understanding what's needed for a watch to run. So any machine needs a power source. So that's the first item that we're looking at here. This is our power source. Now it looks a little bit like a battery, but it is not a battery, it's a spring. So what you'll see is if I hold the bottom part of the spring with the brass tweezers, then with the screwdriver, I can turn the top part and you'll see that I can actually put power into it. And when I wind it up like that, it's winding up the spring. And when I let it go, it unwinds. So if this is all wound up and the power is somehow held in and you can release in a controlled way the power rather than it all letting go at once, then that's your power source. So we call that the mainspring. So then we have this train of wheels here, which is exactly what we call it, a train of wheels. And we usually have four wheels. And the first one is actually the mainspring because you can see it's a wheel and it rotates. So one, two, three, four. So the first wheel is the mainspring. The second wheel is the center wheel. So this is the one that is usually in the center of the movement and it interfaces to what we call the motion works, which actually displays time, but we won't talk about that today. So this wheel is the center wheel and you can usually tell that it's the center wheel because of the way that it has this shaft here, which is how some of the other parts will interface to the part that actually ticks, which is this part here. Then we have the third wheel in the train. So that's this one here. They look a bit different from movement to movement, just depending on how they're related to one another, how they connect to one another. And then this wheel here, this is the fourth wheel. Now, in this particular movement, the second hand is attached to the fourth wheel. In pretty much every movement, as far as I know, there might be exceptions, but every movement that I'm aware of, the fourth wheel will rotate once per minute. So that means if you attach the second hand to the fourth wheel, then that second's taken care of. So sometimes it's attached directly to the fourth wheel. Sometimes there's an arrangement to get the movement over so that it's in the middle of the watch, uh, going through the center wheel. Sometimes the fourth wheel actually sits on top of the center wheel so that you get the second hand in the center. But this one does not. It's off to the side. That's why you have this long shaft sticking through here. The second hand is actually attached to this shaft. Okay, so that's our train of wheels. So imagine this spring being wound up and being held on both sides so that the power can't get out, but the power wants to get out. So on one side, it's connected to the center wheel and it wants to release all the power through here. So how's that going to be stopped? Well, that's what this wheel does. So this wheel is called the escape wheel, which is what we call the escapement part of the watch is what controls how that power is released. And so you'll see that it's got these 
very strange looking teeth. They almost look a bit like feet. Well, the shape of those is very, very important because that is actually how we allow the power to be released. And the way that that is done is with our next part. And that's this part here, which is called the pallet fork. So you can see that it's got two jewels on it, one jewel there and another jewel there. And they are actually shellacked onto this piece, which looks a bit like a fork. This is why you don't clean these with the other parts because that shellac will dissolve or it could become soft and then these parts, if they come off, then the part is no good anymore. You'll have to glue them back on or shellac them back on. Okay, so this is the way up that it goes and these little jewels kind of go in here and so you can see the shape of that jewel is such that as the foot approaches it, it can't advance anymore. But if this was to be knocked somehow like this, then it would release the foot. The, mo the wheel would be able to move a little bit until it engages with the, the other jewel. And then if we somehow kick this back the other way, then it will be able to advance a little bit more until it hits this jewel. Then if we hit it back this way, it'll be able to advance a little bit more until it hits the next jewel. So a little bit of power is being released each time this moves back and forward. Okay, so that's fine. But we need to actually make this move in a controlled, regular kind of way that's how we're actually going to get the movement to oscillate. And that brings us to our last part. This part is called the balance. Now, if you think of an old fashioned grandfather clock, aren't they so cool? I love those things. They have a pendulum. And so the pendulum is essentially an oscillator. It regulates time. So with a pendulum, if you push it harder, it will swing further up. But the amount of time it takes for each stroke is the same. That's the genius of a pendulum. And so every time you put energy into it, there's something that's kind of like slowing it down and wanting to make it go back the other way. And that's called gravity. Well, you can do a similar thing with a spring. And that is exactly how this balance works. The spring makes it function the same way that a pendulum does, which is why we don't have to worry about how much power is put into this. We don't have to worry about it only moving a certain distance each time, because if it moves further, just like that pendulum, if we push the pendulum higher up, the period will still be the same. So that is exactly the, the same thing with this, that the period will be the same. And if we know what the period is, then we can tell the time. So you remember that fork that I showed you? I said that if we can knock that fork back and forth, then we can let a little bit of power out each time we knock it back and forth. See this little jewel here? Guess what that does? Cool, isn't it? That's what knocks that fork. So we call this the impulse jewel. And so I'll just hold this. This part's very fragile, so one wants to be careful. Because this is all out loose, I'm not going to move it that much, but just imagine this moving a lot more, a lot further through the stroke. And each time that jewel engaging in that fork and knocking it. So that's what our balance does. So these are all of the parts that you need to actually make the watch run. Everything else 
is to hold these parts in place because obviously it's not going to run like this with them all sitting on a bench. They all need to be connected to one another and we need to have ways of uh, holding the power into the mainspring as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assemble these parts into the plate and show you them running. Okay guys, here we go. So as you can see, our movement is now running. So all I have done is I've assembled those parts that we just looked at together into this movement. So I've kind of got the minimum here that is actually required to make the watch run. So I'm just going to show you where all of those parts are now, just so that you can see. So here is our mainspring. So you recall that we needed to be able to keep the power in somehow. So that's what this part here is. It's uh, called the click. And you can see this one is a very, very simple design. See there's this tooth here that engages with this uh, ratchet wheel here, which is what it's called, the ratchet wheel. So there's a tiny little spring in here that makes this thing spring loaded so that when we wind the watch, basically this ratchet can only move in one direction. So let's just see if I can put some wind in it. Like that. See how it can only go one way, but it can't go that way. The thing swings back and it won't go any further, but I can wind it this way. Now, obviously you don't wind it with a screwdriver when it's on your wrist. Uh, there's other parts that do that, but we won't worry about that for now because we just want to focus on what makes the watch actually run. So that takes care of that side. So then we said that the mainspring is effectively the first wheel. Power then transmits to the second wheel, which is the center wheel. It's this one here. Then that goes to the third wheel. It's a little bit hard to see. There's his pivot there. He's actually down in underneath, down in underneath there is the third wheel. Okay, and then that connects to the fourth wheel, which is this one here. And you'll recall that I said the fourth wheel rotates once a minute. So then this connects to the escape wheel. So that's the beginning of the escapement. It allows the power to be released in a controlled way. So if you look carefully, we'll do a slow-mo. So if you look very carefully, you'll see that each time around a little bit of power is being released. So it's actually moving a little bit a lot of times a second. It's not moving. It's not moving continuously. And that, as we said, is controlled by our balance, which works exactly the same way as a pendulum. So we have our pallet fork underneath. It's a bit hard to tell because we've got this great big plate over the top of it that is holding it in place. But you can see, hopefully you can see the jewels moving back and forth there just underneath my screwdriver. And each time that is moving back and forth, it's allowing this to move a little bit further. And then the other end of that, you'll remember, we saw it gets kicked by the impulse jewel. So as this oscillates, as this moves back and forth, the period is controlled by this hairspring here. That's what makes it function like a pendulum and the uh, physical properties of this hairspring are what make it oscillate. So it's very fragile, it's very small, it's very easily damaged. And if it gets damaged or out of shape, then the watch will not run properly. It might run, but it will not keep time the way that it's supposed to do so. So that is our balance, and that is the end of our powertrain. So hopefully this has been helpful in explaining just how it is that a watch works. As you can see, the parts that are making it run are just the parts that we looked at on the bench. All of this other stuff is just to hold them all in place. And then, as I mentioned, there's the actual 
other ancillary bits to allow you to wind it and then to display time, but they're not what actually makes the watch run. This is what makes the watch run. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, you might like to consider subscribing or leaving me a thumbs up. I love to read your comments down below. You can support my work over at Patreon, and I really look forward to seeing you on my next video. Don't forget to watch out.